It's my great pleasure to welcome you back to session two for day two. Without further ado, I will hand over the reins to our very capable moderator for this panel. Ryan D. Fong is Associate Professor of English at Kalamazoo College, where he is also the current director of the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Program and the Faculty Fellow at the Arcus Center for Social Justice Leadership. In addition to being one of the founding co-directors of Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom, he is also finishing his book manuscript, Unsettling, Indigenous Literatures and the Work of Victorian Studies, which is under contract with SUNY Press. Ryan, thank you for joining us and I hand over to you. Great, thank you so much, Lauren. Um, so as with the other panels that have been throughout this conference, um, we're gonna be using the Q&A function uh, down below, which is uh, um, to, to ask questions during the discussion time. So please, if you have questions that come up during the talks or afterwards, um, use that function and I will moderate accordingly. Um, in following the example of the other presenters um, and speakers here, I'm going to begin um, by recognizing that I'm on the traditional homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, made up of the Anishinaabe nations of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Bodwadmi. Um, in making this acknowledgement, I'm always mindful of the challenge made by Indigenous scholars and activists to back these statements up with a commitment to engage in the important work of land restitution and material reparations. So I encourage all of us who are here today um, to engage in those efforts locally and around the world, wherever you are. These challenges also make me mindful as we begin to move sadly to the end of this conference of the necessity to think about how we might not only talk about race as Victorianists, but how we might support the junior scholars and especially the graduate student and contingent scholars of color who have been and uh, who have made and are making these really critical interventions in our field. Most, but not all of the moderators and speakers at this conference work under the privileged protection of tenure, including me. And it's important that we make space for these scholars and their critiques of white supremacy, racial capitalism and settler colonialism, even and especially when it applies to our own work and that we respond with rigorous engagement rather than entrenchment or deflection. So to my mind, this is the only way that we're going to build a future for our field that talks about race in ways that address and remedy its historical complicity with these structures and processes. So with that, I'm really delighted to introduce our panelists, each of whom have helped me personally unpack these complexities and responsibilities in their brilliant work. Uh, Caroline Bressy is a reader in historical and cultural geography in the Department of Geography at UCL. Her research focuses on the black presence in Victorian Britain, especially London, alongside Victorian anti-racism communities. She's the author of the award-winning book, Empire, Race, and the Politics of Anti-Caste, published by Bloomsbury Academic in 2014, and her talk today will draw from this work. Mary Mullen is Associate Professor of English at Villanova University. She's the author of Novel Institutions, Anachronism, Irish Novels, and 19th Century Realism, put out by Edinburgh in 2019. And it won the Robert Rhodes Prize for Books on Literature from the American Conference for Irish Studies. She is currently working on a book project on the colonial politics of public interest. Finally, but not in no way leastly, uh, Sari Makdisi is Professor of English and Comparative Literature at UCLA. He's the author of several books, including William Blake and the Impossible History of the 1790s and Making England Western, Occidentalism, Race and Imperial Culture. His newest book, Tolerance is a Wasteland, Palestine and the Culture of Denial will be published by the University of California Press this April. So thank you very much. And I think we'll just go ahead and get started. So Caroline, I think you're, you're first up in the queue. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. I'm speaking to you from London where it is the evening. So I hope I don't appear in quite um, too ghostly a form to you um, thinking about our the session that we had earlier. Hopefully my screen will be sharing now. Oh, not working at the moment. I will try again. <laughs> 
um, hopefully that's working now. If it's not, please someone let me know in the chat. Um, thank you very much for that um, kind introduction and important um, reminders of the politics of our positions, Ryan. Um, I say that particularly as I am um, will be going on strike next week, um, in part um, because of precarious working conditions for more junior colleagues um, in the UK. And thank you for the broad range of conversations that have happened um, so far. It's been really interesting to hear the different disciplinary perspectives that have um, come together. As Ryan says, I'm a geographer. I usually work on surfacing uh, black lives in late Victorian England. But in this paper, I draw upon my research on the late 19th century anti-racist community built around the journal Anticast, alongside reflections on the downing of the statue of the slave trader Edward Colston in Bristol in 2020. In Britain, responses to the downing were swift, with people both celebrating and condemning the event. For some, the intervention of the downing made upon the discourses of public history was shocking and represented a rewriting of history that could be neither understood nor reasonably engaged with. To me, their dismissals and misrepresentations of those who pulled the statue down seem to echo criticisms of those who opposed British imperial expansion at the end of the 19th century. In doing so, they illustrated how, though much more may be known about race in Victorian Britain through, for example, histories of enslavement, there is far more work to be done, I would argue, to ensure that race as a category of study of British history is not decoupled from histories of anti-racism in Britain. And I should say as a warning that my paper speaks to white supremacy and lynching and does contain distressing imagery. The immediate context of the downing of Colston's statue had its roots in the United States. The crowds that gathered around the statue in Bristol in the summer had come together in the context of the Black Lives Matter protests that had come out onto the streets following the death of George George Floyd. Over the final days of May and early days of June 2020, demonstrations were also held in UK cities and towns from Shetland to Truro. The demonstration in Bristol on Sunday the 7th of June was thus one of many, and it was not the first Black Lives Matter demonstration held in Bristol that week, but it was during this march that demonstrators attached a rope to the Grade 2 listed statue on Colston Avenue before pulling it to the ground as crowds cheered. Members of the crowd rolled the statue through the streets to Bristol Harbour, where it was sunk into the waters. The downing of Colston turned renewed attention on attempts to remove a statue of Cecil Rhodes overlooking the High Street in Oxford. And one of the many ways the Black Lives Matter protests were made local in the UK was through renewed calls for the fall of Rhodes. On 10th of June, two days after Colston's downing, crowds in Oxford chanted, take it down beneath Rhodes statue. They were resurrecting a 2015 campaign when a group of students inspired by the Roads Must Fall campaign launched in South Africa that year had sought to have the statue removed as part of a list of demands to decolonize the University of Oxford. Unlike the students at the University of Cape Town, who were successful in having Rhodes removed. In 2015, the students and staff who made up Rhodes Miss for Oxford faced a hostile response from the university establishment in the British media. The protesters were accused of ignorance in proposing acts of intellectual vandalism. Those defending the long-standing presence of Colston in Bristol and Rhodes' honor Rhodes's honoring in Oxford returned to the arguments that they were men of their time. Rhodes was a British imperialist when imperial expansion was celebrated and global anti-racist movements like the Black Lives Latin movement impossible to imagine. To, re to remove Rhodes' statue would not be a reflection of changing context or understandings of histories of imperialism, but a rewriting of history that could not be condoned. And it is indeed true that in his own time, Rhodes was lionized in Britain, but by others, he was loathed and despised. One of his most outspoken critics was Celestine Edwards, who for just over a year between 1893 and 1894 took over the editorship of what was perhaps Britain's first anti-racist paper. For Edwards, Rhodes's activities in Southern Africa during the 1890s were a moral and political outrage. He wrote angry and despairing editorials, unequivocally condemning Rhodes's actions. This was not a man to be celebrated. Rhodes was a thief and a mass murderer. 
Yet, as Edwards reflected in an editorial in 1894, Rose was rarely criticised for the many deaths he was responsible for. Instead of weeping over the thousands of people killed in conflicts which Edwards argued had been made for the express benefit of dividend mongers, Rhodes was lauded. Edwards' dark assessment was that, quote, by curious coincidence in human nature, some murderers are hanged, others escaped being hanged on the ground of provocation, but there are others who kill so many that either through fear or favour, they are neither hanged nor transported. By feet, but feated by their compatriots as heroes. Celestine Edwards' critical views are not ones I heard drawn upon during discussions in 2015 or 2020, likely because there are very few people who know who he is beyond those scholars with specialist interest in black history or 19th century periodicals. But Edwards deserves to be known better not only because he is likely to have been Britain's first black newspaper editor, but also because he and his colleagues show why histories of anti-racism matter. Born in Dominica in 1858, Edwards was the youngest child of poor French-speaking parents. His father, born enslaved, died when he was a child, his mother in 1869. And Edwards' early life was spent as a sailor. For a while, he settled in San Francisco, working in a hotel, and he lived a wild life in the city, finding friendships among a motley crew of gold diggers and miners. But when he was nearly shot during a fight, he thought it was perhaps time to move on. He hoped to return to the Caribbean, but found himself in Britain, and by 1891, in London. He became a popular and active speaker, and thousands of people would cram into halls to hear him speak on religious subjects, thrift, and science. In September 1891, Sunderland's Daily Echo advertised Edward's popular lecture on the Negro race and Darwinism. In this talk, Edward spoke to the theory of evolution and despaired that a whole generation now compared men and women with black skins to baboons. By this time, it is likely he'd already met in real life or by letter, the British white anti-racist activist, Catherine Impey, who had established her radical journal, Anticast, in 1888. Her paper covered issues on racial prejudice, labor inequality, and racial prejudice in India, Australia, and the Pacific regions, the United States, and Africa. She called it anti-caste rather than say anti-race, for as she explained to a colleague in 1890, Quote, I shun the word races wherever I can. It implies in itself a distinction that is unreal. We are really one race, the human race. And so the word race is, as it were, a hinderer of the truth we would spread. And it's perhaps worth noting that she placed the term races in quote marks when she used it. When MP passed the editorship to Edwards in 1893 years later, the paper was renamed Fraternity, but kept its international focus. As Edwards explained, in America, we should oppose lynching because it, it is inhuman and the spirit which promotes it is diabolical. In Australia, we must remind the colonists that Chinamen are their brethren. In this country, in every sphere, no one should be refused any opportunity in life on the ground of his nationality. Nay, not only in this, but in all countries. But British colonial expansion in Africa particularly outraged Edwards. In 1892, he had railed against British actions in Uganda, predicting a day when the injustices pressed upon the African people would come home to haunt the oppressor's children's children. He argued that the British government and its military and cultural power was being manipulated by capitalist companies like Rhodes's British South, Af South Africa Company for the profits of its shareholders. And their financial gains came at the expense of African lives, Africa's independent future, and the reputation of the British state. Edward's contempt for Cecil Rhodes and his anger at the success of capitalists in their schemes in Southern Africa are palpable in his editorials. These frustrations were coupled with the exasperation with the British political class who concerned themselves with the woes of others when they should have been, he argued, considering how to overhaul the structures and behavior of their own colonial constabularies, judges and governors. Edwards wrote his editorials in a sphere of international black newspaper print that included friends and collaborators such as Ida B. Wells and Thomas Fortune. Fortune was one of the most forthright critics of the white press as a key tool of embedding racial prejudice in popular and political life. 
As an example, Fortune accused the Southern Press Association of biased journalism of every stage of reporting relating to racial politics in the United States. Instead of a presentation of facts that news agents purported to provide, each item of news was doctored, either by the reporter who gathered the information or by the state to whom it was sent, ensuring that events would always be presented in favour of white Americans. And as a result, year in, year out, public opinion was every day poisoned against black people. And although in the black press, black communities could read stories about their lives that were usually ignored in the white press, the black editors still had to rely upon white press agencies or white journalists and editors to bring international news to their readers. They were very limited in sympathetic or even honest sources. In Britain, even journals such as the Aborigines Friend rarely published voices belonging to those from the African and Asian diasporas. And this bias and lack of critical reporting identified by Fortune can be clearly seen in the reports of American lynchings in the British Victorian press. I was deeply shocked when undertaking research from my book on Anticast by the number of mentions that could be found. When I first searched for lynchings, I didn't really think there would be many references at all. But there were, and the realisation quickly came that these were not careful or critical reports of violence, but the retelling of graphic, torturous murders using the words of white reporters to sensationally fill column inches. Since undertaking those first searches, newspaper pages are added to the digital newspaper archive all the time. And now a search for lynching as an exact phrase in the British Library Digital Archive will give only over 20,000 returns just for the period between 1890 and 1900. Even considering all the caveats we know of when undertaking such remarks, such research, it remains an unsettling number. There is a general sense of celebration and success around the rapid addition of newspaper pages to digital archives at the moment, but the accumulation of lynching hits, knowing the inescapable fear and torture those numbers represent, is very difficult to absorb. That ever-increasing number includes a range of reports, some focusing on anti-lynching, but most are unedited re- cut and paste versions of, of stories of black families being killed. There are many claims of white supremacy taken for granted in these reports, but the ideas and realities of white supremacy were not only circulating from the American press or its press agencies. Between 1890 and 1900, the term white supremacy was used in the British press reporting on British expansion in southern Africa and attempts of reconstruction in the Caribbean. So as an example, in May 1891, under the header, The Black Question in the West Indies, the colonies in India, which billed itself as a weekly journal for interchange of information on the British Commonwealth, republished an article originally from the Scottish National Observer, which had reported that a steady and determined, though unobtrusive effort was being made by, quote, certain ambi ambitious black and colored men in office, in journalism and in the professions, gradually to out the whites from commercial enterprise and public life and in doing so were really doing all in their power to subvert the white supremacy chiefly by pushing black color and black and colored men and in 1896 reflecting on the ongoing conflicts in Rhodesia Matabele land and surrounding areas in southern Africa the Newcastle Daily Chronicle was convinced that the, quote, very prudent British policy to force upon the minds of the natives the conviction that only by acknowledging white supremacy and accepting the terms offered by Earl Grey in his humane manifesto can they hope to preserve sound skins. As these claims to white supremacy became normalized, those in Britain who opposed British imperial expansion or were critical of its architects like Rhodes were subject to dismissals very similar to arguments made in 2015, 2020 and since. In 1895, at the fourth AGM shareholders of the British South African Company, the Duke of Fife, who act as, ha, acted as chair of the meeting and also happened to be the Prince of Wales' son-in-law, reflected on the company's successful addition of two immense provinces to the British Empire. And according to his analysis, the scramble for Africa had set in, despite the opposition of, to quote, a small and prejudiced section of the community. 
Activists like Edwards were for Fife, a curious set of people who cannot control their feelings whenever any development of the British Empire, however inevi inevitable, takes place. Two years later, a biography and appreciation about Rose was published, but the activists of Anticast were no longer a strong enough way to counter it. Celestine Edwards had died and Anticast was no longer published. Still, even conventional pre press reviewers understood the book to be an opportunity for Rose's reputation to be re rehabilitated. He was presented by the author, imperialist, no subtlety there, as just a little less than a god, a genius, a pure soul, an unselfish patriot. For the Freeman's Journal reviewer, the author was quite obviously partisan, their bias most clearly revealed by the description of Rhodes as a friend and father of the natives of Africa. This was not, the reviewer noted, the impression that was conveyed by Rhodes's friends and colleagues when they had given evidence to the South Africa Committee in Parliament. But it is this literary story of Rhodes as the successful patriot that has survived most successfully. The statue of Colston now lies graffiti covered in a museum in Bristol. And in January 2022, much to the current government's anger and dismay, three men and a woman who helped pull down the monument were found not guilty by a jury of criminal damage after they successfully argued they had a lawful reason for removing it. But the statue of Rhodes remains standing in place. It is hard to imagine what Celestine Edwards and his colleagues would have made of the commitment of so many to maintain the position over a hundred years later of a man they understood to be a mass murderer. In their time, Wells, Fortune, Edwards and Impey raised important questions about structuralized, racialized bias in Victorian news and its role in the making and circulating of the imaginaries and policies of white supremacy. Their criticisms of white print production and its willingness to report uncritically the politics of white supremacy highlights an institutionalized racism in the vast majority of the British press, from the intellectual broadsheet or scientific journal to the women's and imagined to be radical presses. How is the biased, inaccurate, falsified and intellectually limited print, like the everyday reporting identified by Fortune, to be accounted for in our research now? This is an especially um, important issue for those of us working with print through digital archives, where we are amassing sometimes vast amounts of data from newspapers and using them perhaps in new and very different ways. And what of the burden to look through the archive returns for 20,000 hits to see how many lynching returns are in fact reports of sadistic murders? Who will do that work? Who can bear it? Edwards, Wells, Fortune and MP, among others, undertook the heavy burdens of this work in their time. If the work of Edwards, MP and their colleagues was better known, it would surely at least be harder to, not, to deny that there were individuals and communities of people who were fiercely and publicly opposed to Rhodes, his actions and his words in his own time. But a continued failure to engage with the work of Victorian anti-racists, both their activism and their intellectual labour, only reproduces racialized and racist conventions of British history in our present. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so first, thank you to Shukanya and Lauren for organizing such a great event. It's an honor to be here and part of this ongoing conversation. Today, I'm going to offer some thoughts about what Ireland and Irishness can teach us about talking about race and colonialism in Victorian studies, not simply by thinking about the particular situation of Irish people in the 19th century, the fact that they are colonial subjects in Ireland, but agents of empire elsewhere, the fact that they were racialized as other at home, but helped build a white supremacist settler colonial state in the United States. And this is something that um, Sander Gilman touched on a little bit yesterday, but also by thinking about the strengths and limits of comparison. On the one hand, 
Comparison has forged important connections and solidarity across difference. I'm thinking about Frederick Douglass's famous speeches in Ireland in the 19th century. The fact that the Choctaw nation sent money to Ireland for famine relief in 1847, 16 years after the Trail of Tears. Cedric Robinson's account of Ireland and black Marxism. And of course, Irish people's support of Palestine today. On the other hand though, comparison has also been a vehicle through which Irish people have solidified their whiteness, a social relation historically defined through citizenship and property and secured through anti-blackness or what Cheryl Harris has more broadly called, quote, the right to exclude. Indeed, Irish people often demonstrate what Travis Foster terms, quote, the elasticity of white belonging as they claim whiteness and participate in white supremacy and settler colonialism through comparisons to indigenous peoples and minoritized races. Ultimately, I argue for the importance of thinking about and through entangled relations between distinct fields of studies, different forms of oppression, but also between ourselves as scholars with different experiences, identities, and areas of expertise. Charles Dickens' racist essay, The Noble Savage from 1853, famously questions the romantic myth of the noble savage in, or in order to argue that indigenous people should be, quote, civilized off the face of the earth. It's utterly horrific. The settler colonial logic of elimination is on the surface of this essay and its violence is overt. Collapsing distinct indigenous groups in North America and Africa into a general definition of savagery Dickens insists that savagery is that which must be eliminated in order to produce the social order. The final line of the essay violently concludes, the noble savage passes away before an immeasurably better and higher power that ever ran wild in any earthly woods and the world will be all the better when his place knows him no more. I've been thinking about this essay for a while now because of a brief moment when Dickens describes a war council through an allusion to Irish elections. He writes, quote, several gentlemen becoming thus excited at once, pounding away without the least regard to the orator, that illustrious person is rather in the position of an orator in the Irish House of Commons. But several of these scenes of savage life bear a strong generic resemblance to an Irish election, and I think would be extremely well received and understood at Cork. This passage demonstrates how settler colonial logic reproduces itself through bad comparisons. Dickens erases the distinctions between specific groups of indigenous peoples, indigenous and Irish peoples, and of course, fiction and reality. After all, the Irish House of Commons that Dickens alludes to is a fiction rather than a historical reality. It does not exist in 1853 Ireland and is what many Irish nationalists were fighting for at the time. In doing so, Dickens creates a stark binary between scenes of savage and civilized life. Irish people may have modern institutions in Dickens' account, elections, a house of commons, but they, like indigenous people, will never be civilized. Comparison here is a form of colonial unknowing. It obscures historicist and social relations in order to create a social order defined through a single division rather than complex differences. Irish study scholars sometimes reproduce this colonial unknowing and take English writers like Dickens at their word, arguing that Irish and indigenous peoples do indeed share a strong generic resemblance. Such scholars view Irish people as quote, Indians by analogy. And I think, I would argue that this is partly because the field of Irish studies has tended to be organized through a single opposition between um, Irish and English, although that is not always the case and is of course changing now. But I wonder how we can make sense of this comparative act in Dickens' text, this strong generic resemblance that he identifies between indigenous and Irish social practices without reproducing its violence. How can we see Irish and indigenous peoples in relation without collapsing the crucial differences between them? How can we see Irish and indigenous peoples in relation while also acknowledging crucial differences within Ireland, as well as across indigenous tribes and nations? 
Manu Vimalasari, Juliana Hugh, Pegues, and Aloysia Goldstein uh, suggest that colonial unknowing results from the limits of academic disciplines and epistemic approaches that refuse to trace relationships between distinct colonial, racial, and economic formations. As they put it, quote, colonial unknowing is an epistemological orientation that works to preempt relational modes of analysis. In other words, instead of stabilizing the relation between the civilized and the savage at the center of Dickens' text, we need to think through the relations of both similarity and difference present within but obscured by the essay. Such relational analysis requires reading outside of the field of Irish and Victorian studies and learning about indigenous studies scholarship, colonialism in Africa, global racial formations, among many other things. But it also requires viewing Ireland and Irishness not as a coherent structure or stable construction, but as dynamically shaped through complex relations. For colonial unknowing is not simply a product of the British archive, it is shored up through Irish narratives that similarly preempt relational modes of analysis. Take, for instance, Thomas Darcy McGee's A History of the Irish Settlers in North America from the earliest period to the census of 1850, which celebrates Irish people's work to quote, reclaim the land, he means North America, from barrenness and to liberate it from oppression. Written after McGee fled Ireland disguised as a priest to avoid being arrested for his involvement with young Ireland's failed revolt, but before McGee's disillusionment with America shipped to a more conservative political position and moved to Canada where he was eventually assassinated, um, this book chronicles Irish people's contribution to the American Revolution, Indian Wars, building the Catholic Church, and advancement of science and technology in North America. Like Dickens' essay, McGee insists that Irish people, uh, like Dickens' essay, this book depends upon a central division between the savage and the civilized. But unlike Dickens, McGee insists that Irish people are civilized. For him, quote, Ireland advances her claim to respect and remembrance as a contributor to this world's work insofar as Irish people follow Christopher Columbus's footsteps and participate in the settler colonial project. And I think it's worth noting that a lot of Irish nationalist newspapers in the mid 19th century have poems and other celebrations of Christopher Columbus, um, but the nation does unfavorably review McGee's book. McGee ultimately claims that Ireland's history is best understood through studying Irish people's work to shape America. I suggest that this text is useful for thinking about comparison precisely because when celebrating Irish settlers, it so explicitly refuses to pursue relational analysis. After an entire book praising Irish people's contributions to building the US, McGee explores the relationship between quote, Irish settlers and the Indians in an appendix noting that it is a history too long neglected. Asserting that, quote, Indian fighting seems to have come as naturally to our versatile predecessors as trading or translating, McGee concludes, perhaps on the whole, our account of good and ill with the poor Indian is nearly balanced, but there should have been some credit on our side. These metaphors of accounting and claims of credit separate Irish and Indian accounters from larger US colonial formations and render it discrete self-contained account. Moreover, McGee refuses to trace the relation between his categories of good and ill. Being good to indigenous people mean trading with them while treating them ill means killing them. While McGee sees these two acts as distinct, even opposing behaviors, they actually both work together to eliminate indigenous peoples. McGee can define good and ill in this way because he thoroughly embraces the settler colonial project. But he is able to separate Irish interactions with Indians from larger colonial formations and structures because he believes in a stable idea of Irishness. For him, fighting and trading are aptitude, something ingrained in Irishness itself. Thus, for McGee, Irishness is a mix of innate characteristics that manifest themselves in America without being shaped by American structures. When he reflects on Ireland's own colonial history, he again emphasizes Irish character and capacities, writing, quote, the key to all Ireland's modern wars, sorrows, and agitations 
is that those who had the power to shape her destiny never had the conscience to study her capabilities. In this formulation, Britain suppressed Irish capabilities because they viewed Irish people as savages, while America operates as a blank slate through which Irish people can express these very capabilities and finally be recognized as civilized. Together, Dickens' work to compare indigenous and Irish peoples and McGee's work to celebrate Irish settlers suggests that comparative methods require relational analysis that exceed the two things being compared. Categories like civilized and savage obscure complex entanglements between racial, colonial, and class formations. And the idea of an innate, ahistorical Irishness erases how Irish people are shaped by, but also shape such formations. Comparison acts as an engine of empire and secures the social relation that is whiteness insofar as it stabilizes the epistemic frameworks that make relational analysis more difficult. As Anne Laura Stoller warns, when unequal things are abstracted into commensurabilities, they fuel our confidence in those very concepts that are then relegated as common sense. To decouple comparison from colonial unknowing, we need to think beyond common sense and trace relations that literary and historical texts often cut off. In Victorian studies, there's a long history of thinking relationally. I'm thinking about Edward Said, Gauri Viswanathan, Anne McClintock, Stakanya Banerjee, among many others. And recently, there are new urgent calls to do so by the authors of Undisciplining Victorian Studies. In that special issue, Ryan Fong encourages us to attend to indigenous ways of knowing in order to, quote, collectively grapple with these histories of relation and work to confront, but also dismantle settler colonial construct, uh, structures and ideologies. Alicia Walter's excellent work on race and affect offers a another model for thinking in relation, demonstrating how imperial whiteness emerges through, quote, its encounter with the others of empire. In Irish studies, Amy Martin, Patrick O'Malley, and Peter O'Neill study Ireland in relation by thinking about internationalism, genres of white supremacy, and how the famine Irish were shaped by and shape a racial state. I point to their work and the really inspiring work that people are doing at this symposium after thinking about the comparison, after thinking about comparison to suggest that sometimes when we think about race, colonialism and empire in the 19th century, we think about exclusion, what has been overlooked, understudied, ignored, repeatedly forgotten. It makes sense. I know I sometimes find myself wishing that Victorian studies scholars had a better grasp of 19th century Ireland and often find myself belatedly learning about crucial scholarship on empire and race, surprised, but also not at all surprised that it isn't more foundational to our field. And yet studying 19th century Ireland suggests that this framing is in itself a way of colonial unknowing. For race, colonialism and empire is forged as much through relations of inclusion as through the right to exclude. Or more specifically, one, of, one way that fields and disciplines exercise their right to exclude, demarcate their property and perpetuate their whiteness is through modes of inclusion that make it more difficult to understand relations of similarity and difference, sites of solidarity and connection, but also disconnection and perhaps even discord. An intention to Ireland thus can teach us about British colonialism and secure settler colonial logics. It can help us better understand racial formations and stabilize the social relation that is whiteness. Knowing requires confronting the prevalence of unknowing. That is how colonial unknowing shapes our methodologies, fields of study and archives, even in fields like Irish studies that focus on colonial histories, but also how much we have to learn and unlearn to trace entangled relations and forge collective relations with one another. Thank you. Hi everyone, I think it's my turn. And I have to say, first of all, from the beginning that I've learned so much from Caroline and Mary, and I hope I can contribute a little bit to the conversation that they've already started uh, on this panel. 
Um, and I want to thank, of course, Sukanya and Lauren for organizing this uh, conference um, from which we've already learned such a, uh, such a uh, great deal. Um, so the talk I have today is really, uh, it's, a, it's a very much a work in progress. It's sort of, it comes from sort of between two different books. Uh, it builds on some of the stuff I did in Making England Western, and it's sort of helping develop the way to a new book that I'm working on, uh, a book project I'm working on, on, uh, on London, which the question of race comes up uh, in a couple of chapters. And what I'm interested in for the purposes of this talk today is the figure of the Arab uh, as the kind of ultimate sort of uh, perfidious wanderer um, and tracing that figure even briefly uh, in the in the in colonial in European respect, particularly British colonial discourse and then uh, ultimately working our way back from the kind of colonial realm back to London itself. Um, so let's start on what is probably um, a familiar terrain, I assume to at least some of us, uh, in a letter that uh, the Zionist leader Chaim Weizmann wrote to the then British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour in May 1918. Um, the purpose of Weizmann's letter was to, was to further align the Zionist movement with the interests of the British Empire and to present Zionism, um, or to reconfirm, because Balfour already thought this way anyway, but to reconfirm Zionism as a modern Western uh, colonial project very much in opposition to the, the people that he dismissively refers to as the natives of Palestine, meaning the Arabs of Palestine. Um, so among other places where he's talking about the, the need to kind of secure the, the, the British position in Palestine, because of course the British in 1918 were already in occupation of Palestine. Uh, this is what Weizmann warns uh, Balfour, kind of writing to him as sort of, you know, one white man to another white man, one Westerner to another about the perfidious Oriental. Uh, knowing as they do the treacherous nature of the Arab, they, meaning the British army in Palestine, have to watch carefully and constantly that nothing should happen which might give the Arabs the slightest grievance or a ground of complaint. In other words, the Arabs have to be nursed lest they should stab the army in the back. The Arab, quick as he is to gauge such a situation, tries to make the most of it. He screams as often as he can and blackmails as much as he can. Weissman continues, the Arabs who are superficially cle uh, clever and quick-witted worship one thing and one thing only, power and success, which I can't help pointing out is actually two things. And I'm thinking here of the Monty Python sketch of, of the, the Spanish Inquisition, but that's another story. Um, at present, he could, one, one last bit from, from Weizmann, at present, the English are applying just, meaning uh, in terms of justice, just European methods in their relations with these people, but such methods are hopelessly misunderstood. They are simply interpreted as weakness, as a proof how frightened the English must be of the local population. The fairer the English regime tries to be, the more arrogant the Arab becomes must also be taken into consideration that the Arab official knows the language, habits, and ways of the country, is a roué, and therefore has a great advantage over the fair and clean-minded English official who is not conversant with the subtleties and subterfuges of the Oriental mind. And obviously, in writing this, these kinds of things in 1918, um, Weissmann is obviously building on, you know, what, at least 100, even more, 150 years or so of of European, uh, you know, colonial writing about Arabs and other kinds of Orientals, um, all the way through the 19th century. So one more precedent we could look at to kind of establish the sense of what the Arab was by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, for one more example, we could turn to uh, Cromer's book uh, on modern Egypt. Of course, Cromer was one of the governors of Egypt, uh, for the one of the British governors of Egypt. Um, this book is 1908, and here's Cromer now speaking about, again, the Arab. I mean, he's, he's referring to Egyptians specifically, but he, he really means Arabs in general. Consider the mental and moral, actually, and I should say Orientals beyond Arabs, but he's particularly interested in Arabs. Anyway, consider the mental and moral attributes, the customs, art, architecture, language, dress, and tastes of the dark-skinned Eastern as opposed to the fair-skinned Western. It'll be found that on every point they are the poles asunder. It would seem indeed as if even in the most trivial acts of life, some unfelt impulse for which no special reason can be assigned drives the Eastern to do the exact opposite to that which the Western would do 
under similar circumstances. The Egyptian, he continues, takes little heed for the morrow which will dawn on himself and none for the days which are in store for those whom he will leave behind him. He is perhaps unconsciously influenced by the frame of mind engendered in himself and his progenitors from having lived for centuries under a succession of governments which afforded no security to the rights of property, which is that this question of property becomes important when we go back to London, as you'll see. Whether he occupies the palace or the mud hut, he will often pledge his future with scarcely a thought of how his pledges may be redeemed. His life is in the past and in the present. The morrow must take care of the things for itself. And then one last passage from Cromer on the Egyptian. Uh, passing on to the, cons uh, the consideration of another difference between the Oriental and the European, which will prove a, a perpetual stumbling block to the Englishman in Egypt, it is to be observed that the ways of the Oriental are tortuous. His love of intrigue is inveterate. Centuries of, desp of despotic government during which his race has been exposed to the unbridled violence of capricious and headstrong governors have led him to fall back on the natural defense of the weak against the strong, which is to say, he reposes unlimited fa faith in his own cunning. All right, so what we have here, as I said, by the time we get to the 20th century, the early 20th century, is a sense of the Arab as uh, pr primarily unsettled and, and uh, hostile to the interests of uh, reason and justice and fairness and you know, Western codes of, of honor and so forth, but also like the, the very embodiment of the, uns of the kind of unsettled, of the kind of uh, the dangerous and the threatening to order, stability, decency, and, and so forth. The Arab as perfidious and cunning and untrustworthy and, and, and uh, you know, obviously not only not interested in private property, or in property rights in general, but also incapable of understanding, you know, you know, causes and consequences, and has no sense of the future, uh, and so on and so forth. And 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 as I said before, this this kind of this racial discourse has a long genealogy, uh, running all the way through the 19th century. Although interestingly, not much deeper into the 18th century. It really, is a it's a it's an early 19th century discourse, and it builds from there, um, nurtured and developed by generations by then of British and other European uh, colonial administrators and officials and judges, and translators and so forth, going back to people like James Mill and, and, and John Stuart Mill and Macaulay and, and so on and so forth. But what's interesting for our purposes is that is that this same genealogy can also take us to some surprising places, like not in the colonial realm, not in India, not in the Arab world, not in Africa or else, uh, North Africa or other places, but rather to the very heart of London. And uh, as, I've, as I argue in Making England Western, we can see from the first third or so of the 19th century onwards, uh, a, 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 the, the deployment of a racial discourse of Arabness in London um, that just, it just kind of explodes and, it, and it, it runs all the way through the rest of the 19th century, it kind of peters out towards the end of the century, and maybe the early uh, 20th century. Um, so let me share my uh, screen with you. So. You can see some of these things which make things a bit easier, hopefully. I hope, I hope you guys can see that. Um, so the passage I want to begin with is from uh, Walter Thornbury's Old and New London, which is from 1880. Um, and this is what he this is what he says. And I mean, there's other places where he says similar things, but this is the one that I that I have in mind for now. Of all the dark and dismal thoroughfares in the parish of St. Giles, or indeed in the great wilderness of London. Few could be compared with that known as Church Lane, which ran between High Street uh, and New Oxford Street. During the last half century, while the metropolis has been undergoing the pressure of progress <laughs> consequent upon the quick march of civilization, what remained of the Church Lane of our early days was left with its little colony of Arabs as completely sequestered from London society as if it were part of Arabia Petraea. Few passed through Church Lane who were not members of its own select society, None else had any business there, and if they had, they would find it to their interest to get out of it as soon as possible. Its condition was a disgrace to the great city. It was pulled down in 1878-79. And so when I came across this passage and I was doing research a few years ago, I, first of all, as an Arab myself, I didn't know there were this many Arabs in London in the 19th century, you know, a few, but didn't know there were like a whole colony of, of Arabs. But it turns out he's not obviously talking about actual Arabs. He's talking about people who could be thought of in racial terms, sorry, as Arabs uh, in this 
in this, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this particular area of London, so this is St. Giles Church here, and if you go up to where Oxford Street used to be in the 18th century, new Oxford Street was plowed right through this district right here. That's what he's talking about. You could see the British Museum is up here, if you know that. And the area he's, he describes is one that you can see in the images accompanying his piece, are, you know, is the place of, of you know, incredible overcrowding and, and, and depravity and, and, and you know, horrific living conditions and so on and so forth. But what's interesting is that the population, the, la the, the racial language he, 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 re he has recourse to to describe this area and its population is that of Arabs, right? They're, because they are seen to be unstable and dangerous and, and above all, they're, they're seen to be sort of wandering. And um, it's an area of London that had, even in the 18th century, was already seen to be kind of problematic and dangerous in various sorts of ways. In fact, uh, Hogarth's Gin Lane is set in exactly the same location. If you see in the background, you can identify that Hawksmoor's Church, uh, St. George's Bloomsbury, um, which is, this is exactly this, the terrain uh, we're talking about here. Um, so what's interesting about that passage from Thornbury is that it caps, uh, you know, by then already decades of use of the term Arab to refer to the wandering and, and sort of dangerous population of London. Um, here's a couple of other examples. Uh, one, for example, from James Greenwood writing in the 1860s, observe the vast number of city Arabs to be encountered in a walk from Cheapside to the Angel at Islington he says. Dickens, in the same uh, decade, the 1860s, with a nod to uh, the wild tribes of London or city Arabs, he says, uh, points out the London Hasseracks or Abdullahs in laced boots and velveteen jackets who seem to just pop out out of nowhere in, in, in particularly neighborhoods like that around St. Giles in the area around there, sort of in the middle of the metropolis. Uh, Thomas Guthrie, in his campaign to establish the so-called ragged schools for urban children, complained that these, and I'm quoting him, these Arabs of the city are as wild as those of the desert. And in a speech to Parliament advocating the transplantation of London street Arabs to Australia, uh, Lord Shaftesbury, after whom that avenue, which again, so, sort of like uh, New Oxford Street, plows through this, this part of, of London, um, just south of St. Giles uh, Church. Uh, declared that, again, quoting him, these city Arabs are like tribes of lawless freebooters bound by no obligations and utterly ignorant or utterly regardless of social duties. And, and as I said, so, you know, you can find similar passages up and down the whole of the 19th century. Although, as I said, interestingly, not so much in the 18th century and uh, also much less, it kind of dies off with reference to London in the 20th century as well. So if you put all these things together, what you get from this sense of the Arab is the Arab as the kind of the embodiment of the of not only uh, dangerous and you know, perfidious and 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 cunning and all this kind of stuff, but also somebody who's like the prototype, the 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 the, the you know like the the perfect example of the wanderer. And the wanderer is a figure, as 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 many of you know, who was absolutely sort of essential to Victorian racial imaginaries of, of different kinds. Um, and, who, and wanderers were seen to be, of course, utterly inimical to the more settled uh, portion of London's and, and in general England's uh, population. Let's turn now to a passage from Mayhew from uh, London Labour and, and the London Poor. Actually, it's the very, very beginning of, the, of, the, of his multi-volume uh, work, um, where Mayhew says, of the thousand millions of human beings that, could, that are said to constitute the population of the entire globe, there are socially, morally, and perhaps even physically considered, but two distinct and broadly marked races, viz. the wanderers and the settled tribes. And he goes on to say that not only are all races divisible into only wanderers or settlers, but each settled uh, or civilized tribe has, he says, generally some wandering horde intermingled with and in a measure preying upon it. And he goes on to say in another passage, like the next page, um, it is curious that no one has as yet applied the above facts to the explanation of certain anomalies in the present state of society among ourselves, that we, like the Kafirs, Falas, and Finns, are surrounded by wandering hordes, the Sanquas and the Fingos of this country, paupers, beggars, and outcasts, possessing nothing but what they acquire by depredation from the industrious, provident, and civilized portion of the community, 
that the heads of these nomads are remarkable for the greater development of the jaws and cheekbones rather than those of the head, and that they have a secret language of their own, an English kuskad or slang as it is called, for the concealment of their designs. These are points of coincidence so striking that when placed before the mind make us marvel that the analogy should have been, should have remained thus long uh, unnoticed. And what he says, part, among other things, is that we can use our knowledge from basically colonial ethnography, our knowledge of the nomad races of other countries, above all the Arab, of course, to understand, to comprehend the wandering race in our own country, in, in England itself. One last passage from, from Mayhew. Uh, certainly, he says, uh, be the physical cause what it may, we must allow that in each of these classes above mentioned, there is a greater development of the animal than of the intellectual or moral nature of man that they are more they are all more or less distinguished for their high cheekbones and protruding jaws for the use of a slang language for their lax ideas of property for their general improvidence their repugnance to continuous labor their disregard of female honor their love of cruelty their pugnacity and their utter want uh, of religion right and then he so what's interesting here is that Behu then has a whole series of images of these kinds of people that he's talking about um, and when you look at them, if you're looking for Arabs, you, you know, of the, of the, what we refer to as Arabs today, you're not really going to see them, you're going to see uh, other kinds of people instead. But this wandering, shiftless, uh, dangerous, unsettled, uh, uh, perfidious, cunning, uh, secretive uh, population of London was one that he found not just fascinating, but, but ultimately kind of terrifying. And, and and in need of, of some kind of uh, some kind of reform, some kind of uh, attempt to bring them into the fold of civilization. Um, and the examples he give he gives, and those of you who know the work, you, know, you already know this. But you know, there's, he has endless sort of lists of the different classes and kinds and, and sort of classifications of this of these wandering. Uh, this wandering population of London, vagrants and beggars and pickpockets and prostitutes and cabmen and watermen and costermongers and, and mudlarks and, and, and so on and so on, right? So what we end up with then is this, is this sense of uh, uh, the sense that, that if in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, there's, there's a very clear sense that, you know, we in the West are Western and they over there in the East in the Arab world, for example, are, are Eastern and or, you know, Oriental and have all of those attributes. In the earlier part of the 19th century, running quite late in the century, you can still see lots of uh, Arabs, wanderers in general, you know, sort of ori an orientalized uh, populations and territories within within England and particularly within within London itself, um, which of course complicates the the very distinction between us and them on a kind of on a global scale because there are many of them here among us and and it's really if you look at these pictures it's hard to tell was this one of us or is this one of them and how do we, how do we identify who's us and who's them since we kind of we kind of look sort of like each other at least up to a certain point despite this business about the, the cheekbones and the the shape of the head and the big jaws and this kind of thing, which is, I think, harder to identify when you're looking at somebody, for example, across the street. Um, which and so part of what this leads us to is the sense that it's actually difficult to think to to think in in very clear terms within England. Never mind when we get to let's say Ireland, for example, as we heard in the last presentation, or or across you know to in the in the presentation before to the Americas and so forth. It's difficult to to easily demarcate. The, the racial line separating us from them, uh, because these people are also among us, and 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 there's a kind of and they and they pose a kind of constant threat to our our settled our our civilized and settled uh, habits and, and ways of life. So one consequence of this, of course, is that um, it raises the question: Well, what do you do about you know what do you do with these people? I mean, how can they be civilized? I mean, you know, if there was, for example, a civilizing mission overseas. Um, you know, even like, even somebody like Macaulay, for example, can, can talk about the need to civilize India in one way or another, or at least to, to in that memorable line of his from the uh, minute on Indian education, he says, you know, it's our mission to create Indians who are Indian on the outside, but English in taste, I can't remember the exact line, but like taste, opinions, manners, and intellect. Is it possible to do that with these Arabs in London itself, these London Arabs, these indigenous Arabs of London? Can you, can you, can they be turned into white Englishmen, in effect, on the inside, despite their unsettled and wandering and dangerous uh, uh, manner of life. 
um, we have to, you know, we have to ask what are the limits of the civilizing process, uh, not just overseas in the overseas imperial realm or in Ireland, but also within London itself. Um, uh, Mary's uh, the, the the line that Mary Mullen just quoted from Dickens a little while ago on the need to civilize the savage off the face of the earth. You know, does that apply? In Ireland only, or does it apply in the in the Western Hemisphere? Does it apply to Africa, or does it also apply to some extent within London itself? Given that these parts of the metropolis that we're talking about are also the parts that witness gigantic uh, developments of massive boulevards like Shaftesbury Avenue, like New Oxford Street, and so forth, that were that involved the displacement of up to about a hundred thousand people in the middle of the nineteenth century and sh shifting that whole population. You know, not giving any, not like not housing, not giving them alternative housing, but kind of shunting them, really basically ethnically cleansing them to the eastern and, and southern edges of uh, across the Thames uh, of London. Um, so here's this incredible, incredibly confusing crisscrossing of racial tropes and logics and so forth that has, you know, that, that operates inside London as much as it does outside the the metropolis in 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 colonized uh, peripheral zones. I want to end um, just briefly with uh, reference to uh, a story that kind of that 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 represents one of the sort not necessarily the exceptions, but uh, one of the stories in the nineteenth century that kind of, if not trouble, they kind of I guess you could say they kind of mess with these racial binaries and 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 in an interesting and I think uh, productive way. Um, which is the Sherlock Holmes story, The Man with a Twisted Lip, um, which I'm sure many of you, many of you know and have taught and have written about and so on. So I'm not going to recapitulate the plot because it's pretty well known. And actually the plot itself, for what I want to say about it, doesn't necessarily matter very much. What the most important thing is that the, the story is like a lot of the action of the story takes place in the Docklands area of London. Um, in, it, it's you know there's a fictional street upper Swandham Lane so it's not you know it's not clear exactly where um, somewhere near Wapping or, or somewhere further to the east along the river in, in London um, and it's which of course was you know the original Chinatown of London because that's where all the kind of imports from from Asia from the Orient from the East India Company of course uh, arrived um, and uh, so this is this is where the story is set. And uh, the, but the most interesting part of the story isn't isn't actually the, the kind of more obvious sort of there's an opium den and lascars and whatnot there, all of which is kind of straightforward. But, but the more interesting part of the story is where uh, Sherlock, who's completely stumped by this the mystery of you know where, where is this guy that they're looking for, um, he he's stumped. He kind of he has a theory which is not to be wrong, and then he's he doesn't he doesn't know how to figure out where this guy is that they're trying to. Uh, get hold of and then what he does is uh it, he's staying with watson in a, in a house in the countryside the house of the lady who hired them to find her husband to make a long story short and and uh, holmes determines that he's going to have to stay up all night to think this through and this is how watson describes this holmes setting himself up to to cogitate through the night on where's this guy and what, what could have happened to him and so on uh, this is Watson. It was soon evident to me that he, Sherlock, was now preparing for an all-night sitting. He took off his coat and waistcoat, put, up, put on a large blue dressing gown, and then wandered about the room collecting pillows from his bed and cushions from the sofa and armchairs. With these, he constructed a sort of eastern divan, upon which he perched himself cross-legged, like a Turk in all those images of the, of the East, or an Arab for that matter, with an ounce of shag tobacco and a, and a box of matches laid out. In front of him, in the dim light of the lamp, I saw him sitting there, an old briar pipe between his lips, his eyes fixed vacantly upon the corner of the ceiling, the blue smoke curling up from him, silent, motionless, with the light shining upon his strong set aquiline features. So he sat as I dropped off to sleep, and so he sat when a sudden ejaculation caused me to wake up, and I found the summer sun shining into the, into the apartment. The pipe was still between his lips, the smoke still curled upward, and the room was full of a dense tobacco haze, but nothing remained of the heap of shag tobacco, which I had seen upon the previous night. And so what's interesting about this, and then of course, this is Sherlock's eureka moment, because now he's figured out, aha, this is where the guy is. I mean, now we can, you know, come with me, Watson, let's go find this guy where I know him uh, to be. But what's interesting, of course, is that the, in a way, you might think of like the ultimate white man, Sherlock Holmes, because 
he of his powers of reasoning and you know comparative knowledge and his knowledge his encyclopedic knowledge of London and his systematic rational thinking and and deductive reasoning and all the rest of it for him to crack this case he cannot use these occidental methods he has to use or he has to kind of become oriental to figure to crack this case he has to kind of uh, become an oriental himself even if temporarily right because the standard occidental methods of police work and detective work have obviously failed he, he got it wrong when he was in his western self and the, obviously the police uh, as they do in all the Sherlock Holmes stories they got it wrong too because those these methods don't work and I mean as you know again if you've read enough Sherlock Holmes stories you know that he this is something that Sherlock Holmes does quite often in the stories beside employing um the the Baker Street irregulars uh, who are of course city Arabs um led by a guy called the, the leader of the street of these Arabs employed employed by Sherlock to gather intelligence from from the city uh, is a guy called Wiggins which is a, an extremely English name um, anyway, so what do we do with this with this figure of Sherlock Holmes cracking the case, but only on condition that he be, go into sort of Oriental mode? Um, there, are, there are various ways to think about it. One way to think about it is that he's kind of like he's operating in terms kind of like how uh, European and American special forces operate uh, up to this up to the present day, using what, as you can see in this case, uh, wearing Afghan or to my mind, much more perniciously, uh, Palestinian kafiyas as part of their, as part of their, you know, like they're going to become not just sort of tough, well, these are tough guys, as part of their tough, their tough guy kind of credibility, claim to credibility, um, but also that they are operating on the dark side, which brings to mind, of course, Dick Cheney's memorable line from that dark period that we have, this is quoting Cheney, we have to work through sort of the dark side, if you will, Cheney says, we've got to spend time in the shadows in the intelligence world. A lot of what needs to be done here will have to be done quietly without any discussion using sources and methods that are available to our intelligence agencies if we're going to be successful. That's the world these folks, meaning the oriental enemy that he's that the US is out to get after 9-11, that that's the world these folks operate in. And so it's going to be vital for us to use any means at our disposal basically to achieve our objective. So it could be that that Conan Doyle is using a similar kind of logic that you have to become, you have to enter the same kind of imperial dark side to, 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 to figure out what's, you know, what's up with these people. But it could be that what Doyle is getting at actually is that these categories which seem to operate such binary logic, according to such a binary logic, may not be quite so binary, so rigid in their binary structure as they might seem. And, and that people, at least certain people like Sherlock Holmes, uh, can slip back and forth between Western and, and Oriental uh, modes of being. Um, and that even in the heart of the empire itself, one can slide again back and forth between Occident and Orient within the space of the metropolis itself. Uh, thank you. Can clap furiously. Um, I hope that everyone can clap furiously and, and uh, on the other side of the, the technological curtain that is the Zoom webinar format. But um, thank you so much for, for those fabulous uh, presentations. Um, I'm going to try and, and I'm going to invite, um, sorry, Mary and, and, and Caroline um, onto screen so that we have something like a the round table panel <laughs> here um, so you can kind of see you, you together. Um, and if you're in the audience, please um, you know, use the Q&A function to ask questions. And we already have a, a great one from Antoinette Burton that I'll go ahead um, to get us started because it's starting to think across the, these three amazing papers. But um, so I'll just go ahead and read it out loud. When Mary was, thanks for three fabulous papers. When Mary was talking about comparison, I was wondering if analogy works in the same way. Um, and then Sari shows us how the very word crops up in Mayhew, whether or not they operate in the same way, it's interesting to think of these ways of knowing as Victorian and to wonder how do we exceed the methodological Victorianism that is always in danger of creeping into our work at the site of race and empire especially. Meanwhile, Caroline's paper reminds us of how canny Catherine Impey was in this regard with respect to her refusal to use race. I wonder if the panelists might address this challenge a writerly one, but also a research design one. 
I don't know who wants to begin. In Antoinette's characteristic way, she gets right to the heart of the matter, I think. <laughs> I, I, can start. I think that Caroline gave the answer to the, the second half insofar as thinking about like what, like just the idea of being a man of your time, right? Like, and thinking about what is Victorian versus what is not Victorian and what we generalize and what we particularize and what histories we know um, and center in our field and what histories we repeatedly forget. So the idea of thinking about um, like how Victorianism creeps into our work, I think we can be more robust <laughs> of Victorianists insofar as thinking about the histories of anti-racism and anti-caste. In terms of thinking about analogy and comparison, which I think is a really great question and something that I, I, I would love to think about more. Um, I think that one of the things I'm thinking about, uh, which I haven't sorted out entirely, but just thinking about metaphor and metonymy and the way the representativeness and the way that certain kinds of um, how people, how individuals get to represent individual characters and groups, and then how some people are never seen as individuals and only ever representative of population. And so like thinking about um, the ways that like, that then once, once a person represents a population, then there's like endless substitutability for that, but there's no sense of complexity or, um, there's not, and especially just, I mean, that's complicated by liberalism, which is so emphasizing individuation and um, representative politics, of course. Yeah, that's a great, uh, Antoinette, uh, that's a great question. And Mary really, I think also just put her finger on it, this whole business of the question of who, who, can, who has the capacity for individuation and who doesn't have, who becomes representative as an individual of a collective of a race even, and, and who's no purely an individual. Um, I mean, I would say, I mean, partly in response to that, when that's Antoinette's question, that 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 logic, it, obviously, we can see it at work in the Victorian period. People like John Stuart Mill, who says that obviously Orientals don't, don't have the capacity for individuality, and, and that's his terror that we in England are going to lose our sense of individuality. But you can see it today when when a, you know when a terrible act of violence takes place. If it turns out to be you know a white man that does that does the terrible act of violence, he becomes a singular case unto himself, if it's somebody like an Arab or a Muslim, he becomes representative of an entire race or entire uh, civilizational group. So that logic, even if it's Victorian, it still extends very much up to the present day. So I guess I would only add in response to that, that I think, you know, it's really hard. So, you know, I think certainly even, you know, Catherine MP she puts a lot of work into thinking about what you know what different words and terms she can use and she draws on the work of her colleagues in the states and the sort of new language that's coming out of um particularly being pushed by someone like thomas fortune around the use of you know use of afro-american rather than negro and if you use negro you always capitalize it you know but it's really hard and i think it becomes very difficult to the imaginative work to imagine how to talk about race without using the language is really difficult and it's still really difficult so and I think you know that one of the things that that might be you know reflective in the limitations of her use of of caste is she you know MP refuses to use it but you know there's a limit to the solidarity that comes with her movement. And so I guess there is also, how do you build solidarity through languages of understanding? Um, but I think with race and racism and anti-racism, that's a paradox that's really difficult still to, to think through and deal with and, and work with. Fantastic. Great. Um, so I'm going to kind of combine a couple, a couple questions here. So, and I'll, I'll kind of start with, with Nasser Mufti's question um, that he addresses to Sari, but, but um, I think we might, might be, it'd be broader as well, is um, what do you make of the interjection of the wanderer in Victorian culture, not only as a way to make the lower classes legible and thus governable um, to the Victorian bourgeoisie, but also as a way to render the bourgeoisie themselves? Um, and is the novel a privileged site of this process? And he's he's thinking about several different examples of Said's reading of Daniel Deronda, um, but he's also thinking about Kipling and Catherine Gallinger asked both Mary and Sari about, what about Kim um, as, as an example and how that might fit in, but Conrad, even Hardy in The Return of the Native. 
Um, so in what ways does the wanderer as race kind of function doubly as both a site of differentiation, but also of self-invention? Um, and, and what we, can we do with that? I, that's a great question. Uh, just briefly, I mean, I would say, um, I think I mean, part, first of all, part of what's at stake here is that we can trace these operations, not just in texts like Kim or Heart of Darkness or Lord Jim or whatever, they're obviously they're there as well, but you can see them also operating within London, within England more generally. I mean, for example, uh, a lot of, I mean, a lot of texts, I mean, some of the ones that come to mind, for example, Bleak House by Dickens, or I've written about this in Making England Western, I have a whole chapter on making it uh, the mystery of Edwin Drood, which is like a, a perfect case for understanding this kind of figure of the wanderer and the unsettled and then this kind of the forms of transgression that take place. Um, but I would also say, partly in response to Nasser's question, that um, it's like the whole business of the relationship here between class and race is really is really kind of misty in the sense that there's a temptation we have there's a temptation for us to think about the racialization of the working class and I don't think that's exactly what's happening here, partly because the people that are being you know the people that that for example Mayhew were talk, is talking about um, they're not exactly the working class first of all they don't have really a relationship to capital in the 19th century because they're mostly vagrants and wanderers and scavengers and things like that. They don't work in factories. They don't have, and also they don't have a class identity as the working class, which the industrial working class would, would begin to develop. So it's not exactly a class, you know, relationship in the in the in the industrial sense of that term, anyway. Um, which means that I think we really have to think about this as a. It's not just, in other words, it's not. This goes back to Antoinette's question about analogy too. It's not just the imposition of a racial language on a class identity. It really is a. It really is a racial. Uh, identity. It's not a class identity that's remapped in another kind of language, in other words. I hope that, that makes some kind of sense. And I'll, I'll stop and let uh, Caroline and Mary add to this as well. But it's a great question. Yeah, it's really interesting. And the idea of the wandering I was thinking is it's a term that comes up in work that I did in the different contexts in asylum records. So when people usually working class people are found wandering. This is towards the end of the 19th century. It's a reason for them to be picked up by the police and they may quite often find themselves in asylums. So it becomes a kind of, it's a, a point of legitimate intervention to take people off the streets. So it's, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a very specific term, but it's a kind of more than it's a more than something term. I think, it, you know, it'd be it's sort of something that I've been thinking about, but um, you're wondering at large. It's not always racialized. So that would also be a term that's applied to people who are white. Um, and it's also applied, say, to a woman of color that I found who does have an address, but is not at the dress when she has her interaction with the police, but it is also applied to sailors of color who have obviously come off ships and haven't got anywhere to stay and are kind of wandering around the city at the end of the 19th century. So yeah, that idea of, of, of wandering and how that plays into the increasing, um, the making greater and greater numbers of people insane at the end of the, at the, end of the century, I think interesting to, to bring up in that context as well. On the question of Kim, I just wanna say that the quote I read from Alicia Walters is the best article about Kim. So, uh, I, and she's speaking in the next round table. So, um, but I think that her, her work really has, she offers a really great theory of Kim and racialization. I just wanted to, to, sorry, to come back thinking about um, Antoinette's question as well as rightly, I was, you know, the, the other thing is thinking about, you know, the wanderer as someone who's also wayward and, you know, obviously to take, you know, the sort of the rightly work that sort of Sadia Hartman's done and, and sort of to think about, okay, well, how can we turn those descriptions around? Um, maybe that's one way to, to, to kind of deal with that, but <laughs> you need a lot of writerly skill to be able to do that as well. And could I just add one more thing? Car actually, Caroline's response, initial response reminded me of this, that there's another, like one more text we could throw into the mix here to think about this question of the wanderer. And it's one that I've thought a lot about. I mean, you all know the lines, I wandered through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow, right? From Blake's London. <laughs> 
And when you think about that word wandering, it's so often taken by romanticists to mean, you know, imagining and this kind of stuff. But when you put it back into its 18th century context, where as, as Caroline is pointing out, there's, a, there's, the, there's the criminalization, the legislative criminalization of wandering. And then of course, in the 19th century context, there's this kind of racialization of wandering. And that poem suddenly looks very, very different than it does if you just read it in the kind of uh, like wandering lonely as a cloud sort of way, which people are often taught to do. Yeah, excellent. Um, yeah, and it's making me think just of, of the the kind of process that you all are tracking over the course of the, the 19th century um, about the, the intersections and developments of, of these various discourses and the, the kind of contested understandings of, of these concepts so that it, it's, you know, it's, the, the temptation to kind of backform <laughs> these sta stable categories of what we what we mean with, as, as a racial understanding or what we mean as class right is 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 kind of working in in all of these really complex ways um so um kyle mccauley is asking a question specifically for mary um i was interested in how you use the compelling opposition between colonial unknowing and relationality at the end, you seem to suggest that shifting to relationality can re-envision Ireland's place in the British Empire and 19th century racialization. Two questions on this is, first, is um, that hasty recollection accurate, <laughs> meaning Kyle's recollection of, of, of it, is he summarizing it correctly? Um, and second, can you say a bit more of, on how you accomplish this if the process of uh, knowing is, as it seems, epistemologically baked into the text you and perhaps uh, we all um, study? Yeah, that's great. Great. Uh, thanks for the question, Kyle. Um, it is accurate. I think. Um, I think that. Um, I think that um, in terms of thinking about it epistemologically baked into the text, but I think it's also the institutions in the fields, right? It's it's more than that. Um, and I think that so the idea like. The introduction to the special issue on colonial unknowing is so fantastic, and the, all of the articles within it, I also highly recommend. Do they enact the, the call to action that the introduction suggests? Um, maybe not entirely, but I think that I think that one of the things that it, the call to action is. I mean, I, I have a couple of thoughts about this, but one is just how do we listen and learn from one another? In part, because no one article is going to enact that entirely and that we all are grounded within various institutions. Um, but secondly, I think thinking about in Victorian studies, um, the turn to form, which has was really influential in my own graduate education and in my book, but thinking about how the emphasis on form has created this other binary that like form as stable structures, even though that's not what a lot of formalists are doing, but that is not thinking about uh, relationality and especially relations of difference and relation. And, and so I think that one of the things that in terms of thinking about like, what does it mean to um, think about like, uh, working against colonial unknowing, I think one is that like every time we think about form, we should also think about formation and and that that thinking about that those formations are in like how those formations have afterlives, the, the historical specificity of that. But then also, um, and this is something that Ryan is so good about, is thinking about who in um, who as scholars, who are we in relation to, which is another way of saying, who are we accountable to? And I think that um, uh, like, I think that there's a great deal of pressure uh, because of professionalization and the issues that Ryan started this panel with to think that we're only responsible to the job market, which doesn't exist. Um, and I think thinking about like, what does like what does it mean to be responsible to communities? What does it mean to be responsible to one another? What does it mean to listen generously to what other people are doing? To know that we can't master our fields. Um, to know that even a lifetime of work is a small amount of study. Um, and I think that that kind of like emphasis really changes how we think with other people. Um, and I think so. Like I think that relational is not is 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 not just what's in the text, but also how do we how do we position ourselves in relation to living communities? How do we position ourselves? Like how do we make our profession and how do we position ourselves in relation to text? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the shout out to Mary. So I appreciate that and respect so much of what you're doing. Um, are there any questions uh, coming in from Q and A? Oh, okay, we have one from from Sam. So <laughs> I'm giving people time to to type as as these kind of generative 
um, responses are, are, are coming in. So, um, but Sam Tet uh, writes to both Caroline and, and Sari, um, regarding Edwards' idea that some murderers get caught, some are let off and others have killed so many that they are celebrated as heroes, it's conjuring up recent events, particularly the deadly mishandling of COVID, um, particularly in the, in the White House, um, as well as the issue of, of police violence. Thinking about Edwards' comments here, with Sari's comments about Cheney and American soldiers, I'm wondering, do these kinds of presentist concerns crop up in larger ways in either of your projects? Um, well, as I have COVID <laughs> at the moment, I've been thinking about it quite a bit. Um, I mean, it has, you know, the, the, I think it comes up not so much around COVID, I have to say. I mean, you know, there are all sorts of, there are all sorts of responses and certainly it's clear in the UK that there has been um, racialized effects of COVID that um, what we call ethnic minorities in the UK have been harder hit. Um, they've had higher death rates, um, perhaps intersected with a lot with class, but it's not entirely sure why, but you know, those issues are, are starting to come through. Certainly um, drivers on public transport in London were early earlier on, you know, hard to hit by that. Um, and so there's definitely parallels, but the, the government is on a, to quote unquote, war on woke at the moment is what the discussion is. And the, the four people who were acquitted um, of criminal damage for bringing down the Colston statue, the kind of formal government response is to try and turn, is to try and create a new law so that in future, if any statues are torn down, people will be facing a 10 year prison sentence. So a kind of desire to maintain the status quo in the kind of histories that have survived through to the present, these particular kind of history, that is a very active, live and difficult um, political project at the moment. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I think this, this might be the last question. If there's any that are sneaking in, please, we might have uh, time, but um, oh, let's see. Oh, there's more that, but well, there's lots more that have come. <laughs> I didn't see, suddenly there was, there was many. Um, let me see. Um, so I'll go to Jacqueline Barrios um, and she says in, in terms of research, how does the invocation of the present, which I think builds on Sam's question here, downing of statues, um, the ongoing occupation of Palestine, um, alliances and solidarities in the wake of Black Lives Matter, how does it function in producing scholarship about the 19th century, i.e. are they origin sites for questions in the first place, the end point, for, of our interventions and a kind of presentist strategy and making our work relevant. Um, how do the presenters even think about placement of these invocations and something like a talk, <laughs> your book, an article, um, which I mean, I think is opening up kind of this kind of interdisciplinary question about kind of where Victorian studies sits with, in relation to so many of these other contexts um, and, and discussions. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> I kind of spoke to that. I can speak more, but I let others go first. So I can sure. always come back to it. I think, yeah, I mean, I think that for me, um, I feel like, of course, the present shapes how we say the past. Um, and I think that for me, uh, this work was specifically just reading a lot in indigenous studies um, that, you know, separate from any question of the 19th century and then thinking about thinking about some common places in the field of Irish studies a little bit differently, but also thinking about my, my book project that I'm working now about the colonial politics of public interest really came from thinking about infrastructure in Palestine. And so thinking about the ways that um, the Oslo Accords build apartheid roads um, in the name of public interest and thinking about to what, ex like, how do we think about 19th century colonial publics, what thinking about public works and the famine in Ireland and the idea of public interest there. Um, and so I think that thinking about, um, it just seemed reading, reading about the Oslo Accords, it, it 
it's so different, but it just seemed very 19th century to me. And in terms of thinking about how, about infrastructure in particular. And so that for like, that was a specific origin for my current book project. I think, I think it's, I mean, I'll just echo what Mary and Caroline said that it's, it's really important to be able to think, uh, not to necessarily be present as or to kind of sacrifice our work to a present as impulses, but rather to see these genealogies because they're, they offer me this, they didn't come out of the blue sky. And when Cheney says what he says, there is a genealogy to that that one can trace. And I think it's important to be able to move back and forth between the 19th century and the, and, and the 20th or the 21st centuries and to see where these ideas come from, how they change, what their histories are and so forth. And hence to ground what we're talking about. But I mean, I also think, I mean, in my own work, I don't, I mean, I work on, I work on Palestine generally separately from my work, the work I do on Britain and London and so forth. But uh, I mean, I, I, if it's impossible for me, for example, when I look at the, the displacement of all those, you know, 100,000 people in the middle of London in the 19th century, you, if you're a Palestinian, when you see people being unhoused, it means something and it just resonates in a way that I can't help because of who I am, not because of necessarily the work that I do. But that's there, or the similarly, like the, the people who were displaced from the Scottish Highlands in the 18th century into the 19th century after Culloden and so forth, it resonates in a certain kind of way. So I think you can see actually going in both directions, kind of relationships that are genealogical and historical, and but also affective, affective, sorry, I should say. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a poignant place to an important place to stop to think about kind of the the critical genealogies of the, of our present um, discourses into the nineteenth century past, but also our the genealogies of our own scholarly work and and what motivates these projects and and the the urgencies of them. So I think um, and our own relations in in that I think are are really key. So thank you so much for such a terrific panel. Um, I see Lauren has come on to probably usher us into a, a short break before our next panel.